Hi, everyone out there on the internet land. I'm Nicole Zuckerman, uh, representing, oddly, a random assortment of people who do video and media in the Lindy Hop community. Uh, tonight, we have a discussion with a number of really great organizers who um, care about having our community be a safe one. They've got some plans and some ideas for how to make it better, and we're going to talk to them about it tonight. So let's take a moment to introduce everyone here. Um, Hillary, why don't you introduce yourself and tell us what events you run? I'm Hillary Alexander, and I run Camp Hollywood in Los Angeles, California. Great. Uh, Michael? I'm Michael, and I, along with Jaya Dorf and Sasha Shawell, run Lindy Focus in Asheville, North Carolina. Glad to have you on. Nina? Hi, I'm Nina Gilkinson, and I run both the International Lindy Hop Championships and Mobtown Ballroom in Baltimore, Maryland. Great to have you. Hi, Scott. <laughs> Hi, Nicole. How are you? Um, I run the, my name's Scott. I run the London Swing Festival and uh, the Community Swing Patrol in London. Glad you can make it in spite of the time difference. It's okay. I'm in New York. Oh, well, then never mind. <laughs> Hi, Tina. Hi. Tina Morales. I run um, Lindy Fest in Houston, Texas with Scott Angeles, ILHC with Nina and Sylvia in um, Washington, D.C., and I also run an urban dance championship called ISDC in Houston. Great. Thanks for coming. Uh, we also have the wonderful Rick Amatic here on the ones and twos. Not actually the ones and twos. Uh, <laughs> he's got our technical jam going for us because I can't talk and chew gum at the same time. Thanks for joining us, Rick. Um, uh, thank you guys all for being with us, organizers and future audience alike. Um, as I mentioned, this is just a conversation between organizers who care about and are invested in the safety of our community. They've got some ideas for prevention and intervention in situations of sexual assault and probably other things as well. Um, I Let's just kick it off because we want to keep this to an hour. So. Um, Michael, you wanted to jump right in. All right, sure. Um, well, uh, you had introduced the topic as just wanting to, to maybe talk a little bit about um, what we at our events have done or are planning to do. So I can just uh, give a real brief uh, synopsis. At Lindy Focus this year, for the first time we had a code of conduct. That's something that uh, we created. We basically ripped off a whole lot of Mobtown's Code of Conduct and uh, the really awesome one that Fog City Stomp had created and we consulted some really smart, cool people um, in addition to that to kind of get the language sounding like it uh, reflected how we felt um, as an event and um, it is a lot more complicated than just be cool to others which is um, that was all kind of a surprise to me, but um, every bit of it is is actually really important. And uh, and we learned firsthand during the event that um, all those little decisions actually matter a lot. So that brings me to the second thing we did, which is um, in addition to having this code, we had a bunch of people. And I actually think maybe Nicole, you were one of them, um, that uh, were sort of um, safe space liaisons. Um, between the uh, the attendees and uh, and the event, or in some cases, I know you were just listening to people that just needed to be heard, and in other cases, um, some people that had issues um, wanted to speak directly with us. So through through your team, um, they ended up doing so. So if someone had had an issue, we'd end up speaking with them, and um, and this was it. This was year one of trying to be really conscious and vocal about wanting to have a safe space and uh, we learned a ton and if you haven't done that yet at your event oh boy you're gonna like it so much <laughs> that's yeah um, having the safe space at Lindy Focus this year was a really great thing um, while we're actually on the topic I would like to have um, a little bit of separation in the way we're thinking about this between 
prevention and intervention. So um, if you don't mind addressing what you learned on the prevention side, I, I'm sure I would love to hear um, all the things that you would change in the future that you think re went really well. And obviously, I think other organizers would probably benefit from it, too. Sure. Not to put you on the spot or anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's cool. Um, well, let me just go ahead and say that um, with this and with a lot of its related topics, um, I and probably a lot of other people here at this panel are still figuring out how to even talk about it. Um, and uh, one of the big things, of course, is a lot of what we learned is based on some really confidential stuff. Um, so um, we, I, I can't directly speak to every single little bit of insight that we got. But I will say this. Um, the tone of your event um, is set at a lot of different levels. And um, I think that that's going to be the single biggest prevention step that we take next year is getting really everyone in our staff really fully on board with this idea of um, sort of safe and respectful space. Um, so that's going to be that's going to be quite a process, and um, I imagine that most organizers aren't used to talking to all their staff about like this is how we behave, um, but that's probably going to start happening um, at least a bit at more and more events. So that's my prediction. That's really great to hear. Nina, I know that you guys at Mobtown Ballroom, you were, I think, the first to come out with a code of conduct. How's it going over there with um, your thinking about how to prevent things from happening? Um, well, I think prevention is one of the trickiest parts of this. I think the intervention side is, none of this is easy, obviously, but I think it's a being reactionary is a little bit easier than being preventative, I think. And um, what we've been trying to do, because we uh, I'm going to speak about this in Mobtown and not ILHC because I think it's a little bit different, and we have a lot of event organizers, but running a local scene is a different game, I think, a little bit. Um, we try to make it really clear that everyone in the room has an equal voice, whether you're the teacher or you're the person who's never danced before and you just walked in off the street. Your voice is equally heard and it's equally valid. And we try to make sure that you know being a good dancer doesn't make you doesn't have make, give you heavier weight with everything that you say, and and that anyone is welcome to come up as, and talk about things going on, or just ask us to dance, or just ask for advice. And like we we try to be as open as possible to people so that they feel comfortable talking to us. We also make a lot of announcements without trying to be scary, because I think that's actually the very hard part, is making an announcement about, like, if anything happens, please come talk to us without making people afraid that something's going to happen. Because a lot of times nothing happens at all, and you don't want people to have the idea that, you know, someone is definitely going to creep you out, and when that happens, come talk to me. So you want to try to balance that between, you know, this is a fun, safe space, and, and most people here are going to be totally great, but... Like all social environments, we can't police everybody that walks in the room. So if someone does something, please come talk to us. And if you don't feel comfortable talking to me, you can talk to Sarah, who's uh, Sarah Sullivan, who's another person that runs our ballroom. Or you can go talk to Michael if you feel more comfortable talking to you know, him instead. And we, we try to have a bunch of different people. Um, and then the other thing we try to do is once, I guess you were talking about prevention. <laughs> but yeah, but uh, so we, we just try to make sure that we we give people an opportunity to, to talk to about stuff and, and to empower them to when something happens just be like no no I'm not this is not going to escalate because I'm not going to allow it to before uh, it actually becomes a problem that we have to do, address on our own. Yeah, I think you bring up a bunch of really good points, um, especially the everyone's voice being heard. How do you actually make that work? Because I feel like that's a really hard thing to do in a in an environment where there are teachers, organizers, and students, there's already sort of this inherent power dynamic. How do you um, make the environment such that it overcomes that sort of barrier there? Uh, well, we try to focus on how fun this dance is more than how cool you can be if you get really good at it. So we do things like we have a birthday jam every single week, and we have a jam every single week that is a planned jam, but we really encourage, like, 
new people and people that are maybe not super experienced to go in, and then we make sure that we, you know, we support them when they do that kind of stuff. And so it's not just focusing on people that are really good at things. It's, it's everybody in the room that if you want to do something, we're going to support you in it uh, if you want to, like, show your stuff or whatever. Um, I mean, the other thing that we do is we, we, do, we do, like, a lot of contests that aren't dance-based, which is very strange, but we'll do, like, if we're going to have a contest on a Friday night, we'll do a limbo contest. So maybe you can swing out to 300 beats a minute, but maybe you can't bend backwards super well, and then it's like the great equalizer. We also do things like we take a lot of our students out to go sing karaoke. Again, another great equalizer, because maybe you can sing heart like a champion, but you can't triple step at all, and it, it gives people an opportunity to talk to each other in an environment that's not all about dancing, where they can actually become social with each other and realize that everyone in the room is a person the same way that everyone else is a person, even if you're not experienced or you're new. Yeah, I really like that. Plus, karaoke is always fun. How about you, Hillary? I was curious for the people who do have a code or a whatever you want to call it in place and have already had an event or a night go by. I was curious, has anybody used the code? Has anybody felt safe enough to come up and say I'm uncomfortable or something's going on. I'm just wondering if it if it's been shown to actually have an effect at this point with anybody. Um, so it sounds like a couple people have. Uh, yeah. You guys want to take turns, go down the line in the order that you mentioned it? Um, well, in London we've had a code of conduct for many years, but this whole uh, episode of the last few weeks has put, it's sort of shifted our whole headspace and it almost made us want to start again because my culture, the background, is that we want all our new dancers to be like just enjoy dance so much and so we hide the underbelly from them and we realize that this code of conduct, it's related to the teaching team and the top kids and we know exactly that there's a, a chain and an order and a system in place for when there's something and I know personally I've kicked someone out of the out of a ballroom about every three or four months. I go out and sometimes I hear about it afterwards and I have to phone them or meet them for coffee, uh, but the buck stops with me as the head of a big community. But uh, the problem is, what we've realized is that we don't share that because we've, we're have going to have to reevaluate in terms of how we communicate that there is a process in place for you and that we have people that are trained and experienced at this that are not just the head best dancers or anything, they're actually people that are very well qualified to talk to you and to listen to you and to listen to your concerns, much better qualified than me. Uh, so yeah, we've had to really look at this code of conduct and realize that it works to a certain level, but it, it falls short of what it needs to be in light of everything that's happened. Uh, so it's a process that, uh, it's a journey for us. And it's been a, yeah, a hard one to accept that we have some shortcomings in what we do. Yeah, transparency uh, is super important. Sorry, I stepped on you, Nina. Um, we've also used ours, and we've kicked out multiple people. We, um, for us, I think we've we've had to use it, which is uh, both, I guess, a good thing and a shame at the same time. It's sad that we need it, but I'm glad that it's there for the people that need it. Um, but we, what we've been trying to do is make it really clear that whether you're someone who has been in our scene since the beginning and you are very well known, or you're a volunteer, or whatever or if you're a brand new person off the street, the same actions are going to be taken no matter what. So we're not, we're, we're trying to make it really clear that we're not going to be lenient on people that have been around for a long time because we know them. We're, we have a specific set of things that happen, of actions that we take once someone has a complaint, and they're the same no matter what. They're the same whether you're young or old or a man or a woman or new or inexperienced or the best dancer or a teacher or one of us. It's all going to be the same thing going to be the same set of protocol. I think what we've learned through this process is that uh, we need to be more approachable because I think sometimes scene leaders like myself, we're very intricately involved in who teaches at the London, you know, our big festivals and mine's being the London Swing Festival or uh, our blues event and so perhaps there's a feeling that there's an alliance between us and the teachers or that we're not the right people that will listen. So the steps we're trying to put in place is find key people in the community, which they are, 
and they are professionally qualified and we've been chatting to them and they're very happy to take a bigger role in this and that, uh, that there's an email address available because sometimes people want to talk to it after the event, they're still processing and that they know who that email address is going to uh, and that it's not the scene leaders, it's these people that uh, are perhaps promoted through social media or whatever forum uh, that they are actually do have are the right people to talk to and to that will listen. Yeah, I think Scott, I think that that sounds really good because you know being a leader in the scene in Houston for many years and and also with ILHC, we've never had sort of a policy. But I think people over the past couple of weeks, I, I've had a lot of conversations and. And I think people think that things don't happen, you know, because they don't see them. You know, I've right. kicked out lots of people, and, yeah. and because when your things are brought to your attention, you keep it away from other people. You don't. Well, that's you don't right. Know. We all want everyone to think the Lindy Hop scene's uh, this magical place. So I, I guess for years we do keep that away from our students, and we tell the teaching team only. And uh, yeah, it's this little underbelly that we manage, but uh, perhaps we have to be a bit more transparent. Yeah, I, I think so. But I do think that um, the general public out there uh, don't have an idea that that goes on. And that has been going on for years as far as, I'm, you know, yeah. I've been in it for 16 years and it's yeah. been happening the whole time. I think just one thing to think about with that, I completely agree with you, but the, one of the things that we've been struggling with is getting people to understand that things are happening without betraying any confidence yes. of the victims or survivors. and and, and that is a really difficult balance because, you know, when something happens, you you kick the person out, you react, and you take whatever steps are appropriate, but then also, like, you have to go by the comfort level of the person that came to you because some people want to shout it from the rooftops. Some people want to be like, this happened, and it's, you know, lame. Try not to cuss, sorry. It's lame, and I want everyone to know, and other people are like, I'm horrified that I even told you, please don't tell anyone at all, and that's a really difficult thing to do because you can't just say something happened because that just sensationalizes it without actually being helpful. I don't know if that was helpful at all, but that's just something we've been thinking Well, no, about. we have the same issues because then the person has no right of reply because you're saying to them, uh, the person doesn't want to be mentioned you know, in terms of their name, but this is what they've said you've done or this is the actions that have upset them. So it's hard as a scene leader because you're in the middle and you're protecting both parties in some way and trying to figure out where the truth lies. I one concern I have going forward to you know Camp Hollywood in a few months is how do you make that difference between let's say it's a socially awkward you know person who's making other people quote unquote uncomfortable but is basically like quote unquote harmless how do you then make that call to like throw that person out and exile them I, I just feel like I'm not comfortable policing every little, you know, social issue that people have on my dance floor, especially when there are a lot of, you know, kind of socially awkward people that may say something inappropriate or may make a dumb, crude joke. And then if everyone's going to get offended and come running to me like, oh, I want that guy thrown out, I'm not comfortable doing that. I'm really not. I think at a certain point people do have to kind of police their own situations and either, you know, move away from that person or, you know, I mean, what's the liability here? What if I just start chucking people out of my event, you know, without a refund? Am I going to be sued? I mean, what's going to start happening if, if we enter into this new world, you know? I, yeah, I think, too, and, and, I, and I think, um, I think um, one person I can think of in particular that I kicked out um, of ILHC was because it, it got to the point where they were disrupting the event. And so I felt like I had more of a, of a reason to do so. So And it wasn't just one instance. And it, it was just the person really being obnoxious and obtrusive and, and you know, people, uh, multiple complaints coming up, you know, this person's doing X, you know. And by that time, it's like, well, this is detrimental to the event. You have to go. Yeah. That's a good point. Uh, Michael, how do you make the uh, punishment fit the crime in terms of severity of complaint? Sure. Well, as a bunch of other people said, um, almost always the person that brings up the issue has their way that they want to handle it. Mm -hmm. And um, most of the time they're, they're pretty spot on and reasonable about it. A lot of times they really just want to tell somebody and they don't want anything else to happen. 
and other times uh, they want you to tell the offender that they were offended, and that's all that they want to happen. Uh, other times they want a little face-to-face, -face and they want to talk it out and resolve with that person. And we've facilitated some of those, too. And um, I guess, Hillary, to speak to your concern that, um, you know, the, the socially awkward people are going to become, in, in a twisted way, the victims of this, that wasn't our experience. I, I, I found that people really use this idea of a code of conduct that had some accountability to it very responsibly. And um, they only really brought us things that, you know, that they were really concerned about. And um, we, didn't, we didn't feel like we just had accusations flying everywhere. It's good to know. Thanks for that, Michael. Nina, um, you had some thoughts about this too? You're on mute. <laughs> so, but actually, even before our code of conduct, we had some incidences where we had to ban people from the ballroom, and uh, it was not, I mean, it wasn't an, an international Lindy Hop thing, but it was certainly known within Baltimore, and we had, all of a sudden, a lot of people coming up and, and talking to us about things, about things that made them uncomfortable, or people that made them uncomfortable, and... I have to say that as, as somebody who has had incidences in this scene as being a very young person, who I started when I was 13, so I had a lot of very strange things happen in the past 18 years. Um, but I, I think at first what happened for us is that people realized they could say something, so a lot of people just had something to say. They didn't know what they wanted. They didn't know what the outcome needed to be. They just were like, I have something to say, and I finally have a place to say it. Yep. And, and, then, and then we could, without questioning them and not second-guessing them or anything, say, like, okay, so you think that guy is creepy. Do you think that guy is creepy because he is doing something, or is he just making you feel that way, or is it because he's 30 years older than you and asking you to dance? And, some, and, and depending on who it was, sometimes they were like, you're right, I think it's because he's old. And I was like, okay. <laughs> so now that we've decided that, what do you want to do with it? And they're like, well, now I take it back. Or other people would be like, no, they're actually doing this thing. And then I would say, well, do you want me to talk to them? Do you want me to set up, like what you said, Michael, like, do you want me to set up a scenario where you can talk to them yourself? Do you want me to talk to them? Should I give them a strike and tell them that if this happens again, like, what do you want? And then they can kind of help you decide uh, what the next steps are to take. And do you find that each thing is situational, like there's not, you know, I, what, what I'm struggling with is how do you, probably the same thing Hil Hillary, Hillary is thinking is like, you've got X situation and nothing, you know, I, I don't know if it's repeatable, but each situation is going to be different based upon the circumstances, based upon the person. So it's hard for me to understand how you really sort of legislate what you're going to do as each situation is going to be particularly different. I think every situation is completely different because I know that people have complained People have had instances where they felt really violated, where it was difficult for me to understand because it was not something that would personally make me feel that way. And I'm not saying that they weren't. I'm just saying that my experience is such that, like, if someone comes up and slaps my ass, maybe it's a product of growing up in the Lindy Hop scene for so long. I don't know. But if someone comes up and slaps my, I'm sorry, my butt, excuse me, uh, <laughs> I would react a certain way. And when other people don't, it's good for me to to make sure that I focus and I say, okay, well, that personally wouldn't make me feel that way, but what do you need to do for it? And in those instances, what we try to do is, if someone comes up to me with a scenario that I have a hard time being able to internalize or understand, we bring in another person. Mm -hmm. So we bring in, like, uh, either Sarah or Michael or somebody else that, that can maybe help, first of all, help me see what's going on, but also be someone that's a little bit more in touch with um, to answer, uh, to address the Hillary's concerns, and uh, other people have brought it up too, uh, what my teachers and I are trying to do is make sure it's not a scene leader issue, but it's a whole community issue, and that the culture is changed. And so, you know, like one thing that Swim Patrol's always done is said, yes, you have to say yes to dancing with everybody, and, you know, the whole sort of goodwill factor that we've had this motto of assume goodwill, but 
and obviously we've been reading all the blogs globally that have happened and trying to learn from them because it's such a learning curve suddenly for us, even with all our experience like you have, um, that, yeah, suddenly we've had to change our whole focus that, no, you don't have to accept the dance and maybe people just have the ability to make other people feel uncomfortable and that's good enough to decline and a dance if you don't, without reason, you know, and so, yeah, this whole cultural change, and I think, Hillary, you shouldn't feel like it's your full responsibility. I think it's the whole community, but we need to change that culture uh, to make sure everybody looks after this whole thing together and that uh, people are empowered so that they can make their own decisions and so that it's, it's not all going to be people running to you directly. Yeah. And, but I also want to, um, sorry, Tina, I wanted to... Um, uh, go back to actually something, Scott, that you had brought up earlier and that I wanted to um, just reinforce, and that is, um, you know, it doesn't have to be a thing and it shouldn't be a thing that's between the attendee and the organizer. That's really not what it's about. Um, you know, I, I think, Scott, you alluded to this, and this is something we've started to look into also. There, there are people in your community, I guarantee it, almost anywhere you live, that are professionals in this exact thing that know about this and a lot of them are volunteers and they're really eager to, to use their time um, to come and be that person that you know someone that's having an issue can talk with like if, if you as an organizer are intimidated by that, by that idea as I am um, of talking to someone that's having like a really sensitive issue um, there's probably a group in your community we have one in Asheville called Our Voice that we're just now starting to have meetings with um, it's all about facilitating those kinds of conversations. So um, we don't necessarily all have to become instant experts on this. In fact, it's probably wise to talk to some people that like already are and, and bring them in from outside and, and learn from them, especially as we're all sort of admitting this is kind of new territory for us. We're also not all bouncers either, and it's hard. And You know, you have to put that, that mask on and become someone else for a few minutes, and we d it's hard to find that strength to kick someone out. So, uh, you know, and I think that's a, it's a huge responsibility for a scene leader to suddenly take on all these roles. So, uh, yeah, I think uh, we need to empower and find where the skill sets are within the community to make sure it's a real sort of team effort. Yeah, I think those are all really good points. Um, Hillary, you feel like your concern has been addressed? Do you have any like ideas of how you would uh, anything that's like come up as a result of hearing how everyone else has handled things so far? Um, yeah, I mean, I find it pretty fascinating, and I'm glad I'm not alone in feeling utterly out of my depth. <laughs> because when all this came up, I was thinking, I mean, I, I very much am a one person operation. I do pretty much everything at my event and the idea of now having to take on this extremely complex uh, sensitive role of being this sort of mediator is really daunting to me so I like to hear that <laughs> there are mm -hmm. other groups that I can call upon who actually know what they're doing <laughs> and are trained in these departments that can actually help me. Um, I did have a question, something that some people brought up when I was talking about writing a code of conduct, which I have now done, although it's a worth, uh, work in progress. Um, a lot of people have mentioned to me, have you talked to a lawyer? Because you're getting yourself into a very tricky legal place where you're making these statements that you now have to back up and you're opening yourself up to a whole bunch of liability, which hadn't even crossed my mind, quite honestly. Has anybody, did anyone consult with a lawyer? Or has anyone said anything to you about this with your codes or ways I, of operating? I had, I had the same concern, Hillary, and, and um, I had a, a lawyer, a Lindia lawyer, actually contact me and said, you need to be careful about, you know, what you're saying. And so, yeah, I, I have that same issue. And, yeah. And making sure that you're saying the right things. And I, I, mean, I don't want to be, I don't want to be the person that, you know, I think I like what Scott's done where they've got some people that actually are trained and qualified to deal, uh, deal with issues and address them. I think that's a way to go as well. I would like to be out of that scene, as, out of that position as well. I don't know that this is the best way to deal with the actual issue, but a way I think to deal with a liability is that if you have it posted on your website and actually in your at your event or in your establishment that you reserve the right to kick anybody out to refuse service to anybody, you don't have to give them a reason. Mm. I mean, 
I don't like. I mean, honestly, with the, with the few the the blissfully few instances I've had to deal with this, uh, I don't sit them down and and talk about their actions. I say, get out, and you are not welcome back. And when they say, you know, why is that happening? I will either give them an answer or not, depending on the how I feel about you know what it is that they did. But you don't need to sit down and tell them every single reason because I think that's where you open yourself up to liability. You you have the right to refuse service to anybody. And you can choose to, you know, give them a refund so that they don't try to freak out about that or or not. But uh you don't have to spell everything out for them and I think that's where people open themselves up to slander and libel and all that kind of stuff. Michael or Scott, have you guys uh consulted any like legal expert I know that we have them in the scene have you like talked to people with legal skills about um, what it is that you're saying and agreeing to do as a result of the fact that you like have codes of conduct in the first place um, previously uh, we've sought legal advice on individual cases when uh, perhaps once or twice people have been quite um, hurt by our actions and felt that they've been mistreated or misunderstood or we wouldn't reveal who the person was that had uh, filed the complaint and that we said that it was more than one person and that we were justified in our decisions and uh, it was hard for us as well but this is the decision we've made and we stand by it so there was once or twice that we met a lawyer and the lawyer said uh, are you acting in good faith and asked us a few questions and, and we were told that we were well within our rights like Nina said that uh, we didn't say too much but just we uh, it, it, was, it was our space and uh, we had every we were well within our rights legally so we, we've never thought about it since. <laughs> Um, so, uh, since you asked, I would like to say we haven't yet met with a lawyer, but are doing so. Um, we have uh, we have an appointment that's going down soon. And um, while I'm encouraged by everything that Nina and Scott just said, I'm still going to investigate it myself and encourage others to do so. Yeah, yeah that makes sense. Uh, thank you for bringing that up, Hillary. One question I have for you guys, if you don't mind. Um, we've talked a bit about um, your roles in enforcing and um, support that you can have for that. I wonder what sort of role you see the community having in keeping these things from happening in the future. Like, what do you expect of attendees at your events? They're you know only a few days long. What sort of thing do you want the community to give you in order to make it easier to have an environment where this does this doesn't become an issue as often. Well, Nina touched on it uh, earlier. It's it, the the short festivals, the, like our London Swing Festival. It is hard. There's a lot of partying going on, and culturally, uh, people have come in from out of town and they want to let loose a little bit. And of course, we don't want to turn it into Footloose, where we ban drinking. <laughs> and alcohol and the whole thing. Uh, we want to make sure it's a great party, but uh, it, it, it's a real, it's a tough one that we're discussing at the moment because it's a few months away, like Hillary's event, and so our whole team have a big forum in a few weeks where we're meeting, just sit around so everybody can have a voice on the leadership team because there is different opinions on how to go forward with this. We have a 10-year-old in our scene. We have a 90-year-old in our scene. Uh, we want to create a safe place. Uh, so I guess what I'm saying is we haven't quite got the answer right yet because we've got a few months to figure out how are we going to manage this so uh, so it's in a way that we've learnt from uh, everything that's happened over the last few weeks. I mean, I would say I, I hope two things. One, that since I have a lot of uh, minors at my event, I would hope that uh, the parents step up a little more and make sure that their children are appropriately chaperoned, particularly late at night <laughs> when things start going down at the LAX Marriott. And also, um, I would hope that people just watch out for each other a little more, you know. Um, and and if your friend is a little too drunk, keep an eye on that friend. If if you're giving alcohol to somebody in a in a hotel room. Do they really look like they're old enough to be drinking alcohol? I mean, it seems very um, common sense, but I would like, in light of all these events, for people to be a little more vigilant than they have been. I think. But, I'm sorry. I think uh, the thing that I hope the most, and in my experiences with 
being a young person in the scene and being a young person who may or may not have partaken in adult activities as a young person in the scene, uh, I I was extremely lucky to have my my first dance partner was um, 21 years old when I was 14, and he took such appropriate good care of me. Jeff Booth. Uh, whenever I was in a situation where I was maybe doing something that made him feel like maybe this is not a good thing for Nina to be doing, he would make me call my mother on speakerphone and get a yes or no from her audibly. And if you've ever met my mom, you know that's a very scary endeavor. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, but, but she would say, like, yeah, Nina can be at this party. She can stay up late. If Nina wants to have a beer, she can have a beer. But, you know, watch out, and if, if anything happens, Jeff, you die. And he really... <laughs> He very much, you know, protected me and took care of me. And I think that that was, I was really lucky to have that. And I think that if we can start doing that for not only our young people, but everybody in the scene where we all watch out for each other a little bit more, I think that's kind of what I got of all of this. Yeah, I really like that message, Nina. Um, so given the fact that we have a culture like we do where there's uh, teacher-student relationships and um, power dynamics at play, age, and all sorts of other things, um, are there any measures that any of you guys are taking to ensure that like, in agreements with your staff that you have clauses about giving alcohol to minors, about um, regulating people's interaction with people who are, I mean, even of age attendees, are you considering putting um, any sort of um, regulation on your staff in order to um, sort um, of drive home how important the attendee uh, safety is? Uh, we're not at this stage. We are discussing it in the forum in a few weeks, but we feel like that is uh, beyond the scope of uh, us as leaders and that we're dealing with adults. Uh, if the New York community felt differently, we'd certainly listen, and uh, we've got this forum in a few weeks, but at this stage, uh, we're a no. Um, or, yes, we, we are. Um, and not, not something super, super serious, but also just uh, what we, certain expectations we have of our staff. And uh, so that that will be coming for for Lindy Fest for ILA. We haven't discussed that yet, but uh, yeah. Um, I mean, you know, I don't. I personally don't want to see my instructors that you know I'm paying to be smashed and obliterated in the ballroom. You know, you're you're there for the event. I, I mean, drink, have a good time, but not to the point where. It's it's out of control, that kind of thing. So I mean, I think there there does need to be some sort of limiting of behaviors that we've seen in the past. I I completely agree. I I do have a little bit of a hard time with deciding where those lines are because personally, I mean, I kissed my boyfriend for the first time at Camp Jitterbug, and he was my student, and now we've been dating for eight years, and I'm very glad that Camp Jitterbug was a place that I could kiss Michael. Thanks, Camp Jitterbug. Uh, I mean, if, if someone had told me, like, you're not allowed to interact with your students at all, when when would Michael and I have seen each other? We live 3,000 miles away from each other. Yeah. And so I think I think that is important. It, it's important to make sure that people are being appropriate, but I, it is also very difficult to tell people they can't do things because, for example, let's use this as an example. If you tell me that I'm not allowed to have sexual situations with any of my students, I won't do it. If I am the kind of person who is going to do something predatory and terrible, I'm going to do that whether or not you tell me I can have sex with my students or not. Yeah. You know what I mean? And, and, and I'm not saying that we should everyone should just do whatever they want and we should just leave the rules open and hope for the best, but it's a really hard line because, I mean, I would follow those rules, but I'm also not the kind of, I hope not the kind of person I would. Yeah. And I probably, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't go so far as say something like, you know, they couldn't uh, have interactions with their students. I think that's, that's a little bit too far with the dating, whatever, whatever they want to do with them. But I think the appearances need to be a little bit better. And, and what I've seen, I would like to see a little bit better behavior out of the instructors. Yeah, I wanted to jump in. I think I, think I feel I, really similar to Tina and... Uh, we, we don't have uh, a, any kind of policy like that right now. Um, it's pretty likely we're going to have something for the next round. And um, 
I, I certainly wasn't thinking along the lines of, uh, you know, strict lines between teachers and students. Um, if anything, as other people have talked about, we don't want those, we don't want to draw attention to those distinctions, actually. It's more like the same kind of good behavior we want to see from, um, you know, this person also applies to this person. And, um, and also what Tina said about appearances, that does kind of matter to me. I mean, I, I have to kind of ponder it, but, um, you know, a, a person that's paid staff is, is a reflection of the event. And um, if they're a mess, then it doesn't it doesn't look good for anybody. And and you know I'm not I'm not trying to be superficial. It's not just about how it looks, but it also just doesn't feel good. Doesn't. You know, it just it feels like there's just a mess happening right now. You know, and like is this going to lead to other messier stuff? I don't know. There's something about it's not right. And um, I really would like to see instructors take. Um, take a lot of responsibility, and by the way, a lot of them are super awesome, so it's not like instructors are just like these horrible people that need to be reined in. There's some really, really beautiful people out there, too. All right, I've been diplomatic enough for the day. <laughs> <laughs> also, oh, go ahead. Sorry. Just, just very shortly, because I'm also an instructor, like, I know that I started teaching for you, Tina, when <laughs> I was 14, and I, I know that, like, I, I feel like my becoming an adult in the public view has at times been a little terrible. Like I like it's been a very awkward growth at some points and I've certainly done things that were inappropriate in ways like being too drunk or being too crazy or like being a total nut job or like freaking out in a hotel room and like throwing things around and having the police called at five AM because we were super loud. You know, pretending you're in Van Halen or whatever. Uh, but it, I think that that's been that's been something that's been really hard for me is because I didn't start in this as an adult. I'm 30 now. Now I want to go to bed at like 12:45. You know, but when I was 22, that was really different. And I think that maybe as our scene is getting older, maybe the teachers need to. Some of us, I'll include myself in it, need to kind of catch up with where we are in our lives. We're not 21 anymore, which is fine. I don't. I mean, I don't. You know, I don't. I don't know. But I, I think that we could kind of catch up with where we are and maybe figure out where the scene is now and we can all change our behavior a little bit, myself included. And that's what, something I'm going to try to do. Yeah, I think that you guys have all brought up some um, really important things about um, Nina, how you mentioned that uh, you as someone who cares about what you're being asked to do, if you said, um, if a contract or something said don't do this thing, you wouldn't do the thing and possibly if you were um, a predator that you wouldn't feel so, such compunction, some, excuse me, such compunction about it. Um, and another piece being that it's hard to draw the line between uh, what's appropriate and what's not given that drinking and um, hanging out, interacting, hooking up are all part of our culture. Um, I'm curious about what sort of steps you guys are taking either as organizers of your event or just as participants in your scenes to sort of disambiguate between predatory dangerous actions and um, having a, a rough night um, and figuring out where that line is and how you change your actions accordingly. That's a weird one, I'm sorry. Anyone have any idea ideas? <laughs> Well, I think like, you, whoever solves this is going to is gonna <laughs> millions. I, I think this is the hardest one of, of all. And I, and I think, for me, I, I find it very, very hard to legislate that. I think it's more just like, you know, with all the discussions going around, it's really like, you know, if you see something, you should say something. And, and to sort of trust your gut. For me, um, I've been through the most situation, and I saw something, and I didn't trust my gut because my gut told me something was wrong. And I, um, that's Mo Jones way back. Um, I guess it was back in the early 2000 or 1999, somewhere around there. Um, the same with the Bill Bergita situation. I, I trusted my gut on that. Um, um, but I, I think that's that's when it gets to that. It's a little harder. Uh, but if you see something, you should say something or check it out a little bit further and be a little bit more diligent about it, following up. 
Yeah, I think uh, for us in London, we just want to have a stronger voice for the beginners, for the new people who come in dancing and know that there is a channel. And I think uh, people know when something's wrong. You know, you get a sense. And I think people get a sense and they might just never come to a Lindy Hop event again. But if we can create a culture that we're more open and that they feel like, oh, hang on, yeah, I read a code of conduct. I heard something said about this. This is wrong. I don't feel good. And I hear there's some people I can talk to. So I think there's a whole cultural change that we're about to uh, embark on. And, um, yeah, it, but it's so hard to, to know, you know, who's having a rough night and what is predatory. But I think it comes down to the two people and the person that's being affected the most that uh, where the answer will lie. Yeah, I think that's a good call. Um, so one question I sort of have, you guys are an assortment of people who are a combination of organizers of events that everyone attends once a year and things that people do on a weekly basis. What do you think the challenges are in this particular kind of situation for each of those roles or the benefits? Anyone mind being the first to uh, talk about it? Nina, hit me. <laughs> uh, also, I love that you've been trying to not curse because normally on Swing Nation, I'm the first to drop an F-bomb at time. <laughs> Well then, I can feel okay. I'm, I can loosen up then. Uh, yeah. I think that I think there's you know there's there's difficulties and ease in, in kind of both. And I think that like for for me at the ballroom, having a community that sees each other all the time, people feel more comfortable coming up to me at the ballroom and saying that something's going on, or they feel uncomfortable, or even just they're having a shit day and they want to talk. People feel here. They feel I'm at the ballroom right now. They feel more comfortable coming up to me here than they would say at ILHC. Because I see these people every week. Like I said, we sing karaoke together. They watch me, like, wash dishes and unclog toilets and be just, like, a normal person in the scene. And then I think sometimes at, at the bigger events, the, the teachers or the promoters or the whatever are looked at kind of from afar. And it's, it's much harder for people to come up and, and be able to talk to me. And, I, and not that I have to be the person they talk to, but... For me, it seems much easier here in the ballroom because I have a, usually much more of a relationship with these people. And even though some of the people that come to ILHC I've known for 18 years, I've seen them an accumulative two months in 18 years versus the people that have been dancing six months here that I've seen three times a week for six months. Um, so for me, I feel like it's a, it's, I'm having an easier time with it at the ballroom than I am in the idea of having a big, huge event and how, how we're going to deal with all this stuff and with policies and reactionary things at ILHC, I think is a little bit more difficult than, than for here. We also have the added um, thing about there's not only is there a cultural difference, there's cultural differences with all the different countries coming as well. So it's, you know, maybe certain things aren't being the way they are here. And, you know, so uh, I, I, I don't even know how to begin with some of it. So. I'm struggling with ILHC along with I think Hillary and some of the larger events. But yeah, and also when you have a once a year event, as I'm sure Michael you have with Lindy Focus, it's a it's a huge um, time for people to just let their hair down and party and go nuts, especially in a hotel where they don't have to drive. Mm -hmm. And there's all the after parties in the rooms, and there's liquor flowing and drugs flowing and Honestly, that's what they're there for, and I don't want to suck all the fun out of my event, quite honestly. I mean, I'm, I'm kind of proud of the fact that Camp Hollywood is, in my opinion, kind of squeaky clean and innocent during the day, and then when the lights go down, it turns into this whole other crazy animal. And I, I love that about it, and I want to keep that quality. But, you know, with the alcohol and, and the after hours and all that, that's where the things start happening. So we have that challenge of people coming with this expectation of having a wild party and we kind of want to pull the reins in but we don't know how to do that or if we even should do that. Yeah. How do you not change the identity of the event that you've created? You know? Yeah. And like I said, I, I just, I have a fear that all of this that's going on is going to suck the fun out of what we do. Like, not for us as organizers, but for attendees. You know, because years ago, I had someone want me to put up a big disclaimer at Camp Hollywood saying, we won't tolerate this, and we won't tolerate this, and we won't tolerate this. 
And I didn't do it because I thought, you know, if I were a brand new dancer coming in here and I saw this huge placard saying, we're not going to tolerate harassment and we're going to I'd be like, well, what the heck happened here that they had to write all of that? And what am I in for when I walk through these doors? I, just, I understand now that I have to do it because things have yeah. changed. But, mm -hmm. you know, back then, 15 years ago, I was like, I'm not putting all that in front of my event. Hey, welcome to Camp Hollywood. and We're not going to be a part of sexual assault here, yeah. you know? Like, how welcoming that, is that, you know? A lot of that, Hillary, though, <laughs> I mean, I don't know, but... I, I bet that at first you might feel that way and others might feel that way, but that's just like a kind of bump that we have to endure in order to get a little bit more um, more of the stuff out into the open. Yeah, I, do, I agree. I do think that might be sort of like a, a gut reaction to a placard and maybe the placard shouldn't be you know too shiny or whatever, but like um, I, I do think it has to talk, be talked about and I don't think it's going to take the fun out. You know, the fun is... You know, well, first of all, the fun is dancing. Dancing is great. It's super fun. That's not going to change. And, like, what people do in hotel room parties after, that's also pretty much going to continue to happen. Like, people like to have fun. They're human beings. So I don't think we're going to suck the fun out. I think um, we're just going to we're just gonna try to make it a little bit more respectful to our fellow human being by, by acknowledging that stuff happens and dealing with that, the bump of that acknowledgement and, uh, and then moving on. Well, and I think, I think, too, having just being a little, I mean, this is something that I'm struggling with, but just being a little bit patient to see what the flow of what's going on right now is going to be, because I think what's going to happen is there's going to be a ramp up of a lot of emotion and a lot of feelings and a lot of things going on, and we're going to hopefully settle in a much better place than we started. I, I don't think the next few weeks are going to be the least painful in Lindy Hop history, uh, but I do think that this kind of stuff needs to happen, and even though it's awkward and the growing pains are really difficult, we're going to settle somewhere that's so much better and that we can progress from. Yeah. Yeah. I agree with all of that, both Nina, Michael, and, and definitely what Scott said about, you know, it is going to need a, a sort of change of culture, and that, that does have to happen. Um, but I think we'll get there. Yeah, it's a conversation that we've all needed to have. It's been bubbling under the surface. Uh, I think the parting will continue, and let's hope it does. But I think, uh, as Michael said, that the respect for each other and looking out for our own, looking out for the community, yeah, I think this is going to be uh, something really positive is going to come out of uh, this last little chapter of uh, the Lindy Hop world. Great. Uh, thank you all. This has been really great. Um, I just want to go along, everybody, and give you guys a chance to do any last thoughts about the whole situation. Um, let's go reverse order of the way that we came. Tina, do you have anything to <coughs> wrap up that you want to say? Um, no, I can't think of anything. Just that, you know, I, I do think, uh, like I said, it's going to take a culture change, and, and people need to be patient. And uh, while we have to figure this out, uh, and we will figure this out as a community, I believe. Awesome. Scott, what do you think? Uh, I think it's been a real grieving process for a lot of us over the last few weeks and what we've been trying to process uh, everything and I think uh, as a whole and as a big community uh, we will find our way because it's it's just something that's had to have happened and um, yeah, I, I can see the positive steps happening already all over the world so uh, yeah, let's hope for a new day and uh, let the partying continue. Thanks Scott. Nina, this is your chance to be vulgar if you want it. Uh, fuck. Okay. Um, I, I think honestly, for me, uh, I'm I'm gonna try to get better at the things that that we're trying to do with the ballroom and we're trying to do with ILHC. But honestly, I think the thing that has the thing that I've been thinking about the most is my own actions and what I can do on a personal level as a teacher and as just someone in the scene, and how I can hold myself to a super high standard of making sure that. I'm a I'm a good ambassador to this dance, and that I like I have a responsibility to make sure that I do the right thing, and that I'm there for people, and that I am as accessible as possible, and uh, try to hold myself to a standard that I want to see other people holding themselves at. Yeah, I really like that, Michael. Um, yeah, gosh, that was that was great, Nina. Um, I. Uh, I guess I would just say uh, 
my next step is the same thing as the last step, which is just to continue to try to educate myself and learn. Um, I, you know, and if I would offer one thing to any random person who's watching that's like skeptical of this whole conversation, like, you know, your gut emotional reaction to a situation isn't always right. I mean, sometimes you got to trust it, but sometimes you got to keep an open mind and um, be willing to listen to other people and, and see see if they might not have something worthwhile to add to the conversation because I know my own opinions have evolved a lot on this stuff recently and I would just encourage everyone to, to keep learning about it. Yeah, that's a really good point. Hillary, how are you doing? Good. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm glad, I'm glad everybody's being very, very positive and now I feel more positive. Um, I, I always look for opportunities to, to sort of up my game and be more professional because God knows I have no degree in this. I run no other events. I really have no idea what I'm doing other than that I've done it 18 times. So um, if this is going to make my event better and safer and more welcoming, um, I'm, I'm all for it, you know. And if it makes our scene better and safer and more welcoming, great. I mean, let's bring it on. That's what I say. Awesome. Um, again, thank you all so much for being here. Um, I I hope that we continue this conversation. I hope that I hear more from you guys about um, your thinking and your um, the way that your events are evolving as a result. And I'm I'm really excited for the way that we're going to move forward in this. So, thank you all for being a part of this. I'm Nicole. Zuckerman. Uh, I live in San Francisco. I run zero events, but I attend a bunch of them. And uh, thank you all for watching. Thanks, Nicole. Hi, everybody. Thank you.